Hello and welcome back to Adventurous Way. I'm Matt and behind the camera is Diana and we're here today at Mesa Verde. This is our 30th stop on our journey to visit all 419 national park units across the US. We're starting our day exploring Mesa Verde National Park really early this morning because the first thing we're going to be doing is the Cliff Palace Ranger Led Tour. But after that, we're going to be exploring the rest of the park as well. So come along and let's see what we can find here. Cliff Palace is the largest cliff dwelling at Mesa Verde National Park and in North America. We're walking down the trail now on the Ranger Led Tour and the path is pretty uneven down here. There's some pretty narrow steps, some pretty uneven pavement and surfaces and things. Just got our first glimpse of some cliff dwellings through there. Almost 5,000 archaeological sites, including 600 cliff dwellings, make this national park a must-see destination. Not only that, it has also been recognised as a UNESCO World Heritage Site. We don't really see evidence of like a hierarchy of like the chief would live up in the tower or something like that. Like it's more of a democratic, sort of egalitarian society that we see here. And yet yeah, most living spaces are on the first floors. T-shaped doors oftentimes mark living spaces. Um, and they're kind of interesting. Do you think those came up as an influence from the Chaco Canyon area? Uh, they were very prevalent in that particular dwelling. And so Chaco Canyon collapsed in the 1100s and people were still living here until about 1300. And so we think maybe some people may have come up from Chaco to Mesa Verde um, for a, a new home space. Um, and may have brought this particular style with them. And the sort of functional thought on the T-shaped door is if you're heating that space to live in it, um, or you're cooking in there, whatever. Um, let's say you're heating it, it's a smaller opening to cover up so you could retain heat a little bit better, um, but you could still walk through that door with a pack on your back. Then a lot was accomplished with those tools. So they likely would have gotten their stones to make tools um, from river areas. So the closest river was Mancus, and that was about four miles away. So that is about a four mile hike to go get your materials just to start making your tool itself. Um, and then they would come back here. And so the alcove formation usually would leave tons of boulders um, and broken off bits of sandstone in the actual alcove itself. So they had their building material right here. And then the mortar was made from uh, sandy soils, ash and water, and it's very resistant. We are actually still looking for the exact recipe that they were no using. Kidding. And as we walk by this first kiva, um, you'll see little discs inside of it um, that look like hockey pucks. And those were done, I think, in about the 80s. And they are different recipes to recreate the mortar used here. And you can see some of them are working and some of them not so much. But we're, we're just testing out the weathering on it. The kivas can sort of be looked at as an evolution of the earliest architectural type in the mesa top, which is the pit house. So the earliest um, settlers and the earliest farmers in this area were coming in around 550 to 600, and the first permanent structures we see are pit houses dug right into the ground. Um, they were much shallower than this, but they would have had the same basic shape. It would have been a round uh, structure, and then it would have had a bench or banquette along the sides. But over a couple hundred years, they started developing masonry, and so even when we see masonry structures start coming in around the mid 700s, there's always a pit structure associated with them. So you get this separation of space. The pit house is no longer the all purpose family home. You don't need to do everything there. You've now got masonry structures where you can work or cook or store um, foodstuffs. That's when the pit structure becomes more of a kiva and it takes on this, this special uh, purpose, a little bit more ceremonial, uh, spiritual space, um, also still very much a living space though. Um, they are, we are in the middle of the Colorado mountains, uh, well, high areas, uh, so the winters here do get pretty cold. So pitch structures were probably still very popular, especially in the winter, um, because this would have been a lot easier to heat and we would have retained a lot more heat more easily than the above ground structures because you've already got the natural insulation around all sides. Um, and then the roof had several layers to it as well. So you've got in the kiva, the six pilasters along the walls, and these would have been the, the primary base roof supports. There'd be a hole left in the center of that roof 
And that would be for entry and exit. They would use a ladder to get in and out of the, of the room. But it also served as ventilation because the fire pit was in the center. And then you had the deflector wall. Um, and behind the deflector wall is a fresh air intake. The vent to which is just over here yes. uh, behind the little um, half wall that we have there. And so the air would come down, hit the deflector wall, circulate the room, and then that would help regulate the temperature inside, but also help push the smoke out the top um, for a little bit of ventilation. Still probably would have been a kind of a smoky space in there though. Uh, but very warm, and you would probably use a lot less fuel to keep this warm throughout a whole Colorado winter than maybe the second floor of a you know, single layer stone structure. But one of the considerations that we thought about, we don't know the exact reason they decided to come down here. Um, but one is water. And the alcoves present a really great advantage in that they have a direct water source right in the back of them. And the one here is still flowing. Um, so they've got what's called a steep spring. And that's created by um, just rainfall and snow melt, any moisture um, that comes into the sandstone. The sandstone just absorbs it like a sponge. And gravity pulls it down till it hits a layer it can't go through vertically. Um, usually here it's a shale layer. And so it forces its way out and creates cracks and fissures and then eventually boulder fall and creates the alcoves, but the steep spring's still running. Um, even to this day, it's still flowing in the back, and that's fresh, filtered, highly drinkable water that's coming directly into the back of this alcove, and directly into the, to the use for the people who were living here. So it may have been a reason to come down here. Um, it, that was also a period when a drought was starting in the region, um, so they may have wanted better access to water, um, so that could have been a... a a push to come into these spaces. Um, another thought was they wanted to clear off the mesa top to have more usable land, so that they weren't using that for living space as much, but then could start farming in where houses had been. But for a long time, the archaeologists that were working here had tons of holes in the record because no written language leaves a lot of questions. Um, even <clears throat> in my background in history, even with a written record, you still get tons of holes and questions. Um, so eventually, uh, after decades of studying this site and talking to the local groups, um, particularly the Ute, who are right next door still, um, who don't claim any attachment or history to this place, they finally started talking to the folks who do draw their history back to here, the ancestral, or the modern Puebloans. Um, and that has filled in a lot of holes for us, because the one thing that they did take with them and always passed along was that oral history that they have and their, their tradition and their knowledge of farming in a desert and cultural history or cultural knowledge of, of uses of kivas um, and, and items like this. Uh, so having that relationship with those modern groups is just a really special way to be able to understand more and be able to really connect with the, the history of this place and the people who draw to that history. Okay, so we've just stopped in at the Chapin Mesa information point and just tried to plan out the rest of our day. I think our first port of call is going to be to do the Mesa Top Loop Drive. So we've got the little guidebook here. And then I think after that, we're going to head around to Wetherill Mesa and there is a hike over to Longhouse uh, that we want to go and have a look at. So for now, we're going to be doing the Mesa Top Loop Drive. People lived in the area here for thousands of years before eventually coming to Mesa Verde itself. But when they did arrive here, one of the first types of structures they built were pit houses. And here we have one of the best preserved examples of a pit house found anywhere. This pit house was built somewhere around 600 AD, and it shows a very primitive, very simple home with a kitchen, a storage space, and a fire pit in the middle. We've stopped again on the journey around the loop road here, and the next stop is to look at some more pit houses. Although this may look like one pit house, it's actually two. The front room was built around 700 AD, but later was destroyed in a fire. And the second room was built after that first one was destroyed. 
There's a couple of things here that are really noteworthy about the pit houses. The first is it's much deeper than the last one that we saw. These are dug around four feet down into the ground. The second feature is in the, old, in the, the newer of the two pit houses, there is a vertical ventilator shaft. This is a feature that was seen from pit houses then on. Over time, the architecture of the ancestral pueblos evolved from pit houses underground into above ground dwellings like this one here. This was built in about the year 850 CE and really shows how the architecture started to evolve. However, the pit houses didn't disappear. And in fact, right near this uh, above ground dwelling here, we have a much deeper pit house that's, than has been seen before. And it's believed that these deeper pit houses are what became the kivas that the ancestral Puebloans continued to build into the future. After doing the loop drive, we stopped for some lunch at the little information visitor centre thing at the Weatherall Mesa, and now we're on a new trail. This time we're off to see the Step House. It's about a one mile round trip little hike to, to go and see it, and then after that we're going to go on a slightly longer hike to go and see the Long House. Here at the Step House site there's a number of different buildings. There's the pit houses um, on one side. Those were built much, much earlier than the step house that we can see here as well. The pit houses would have been built sometime around about 620 CE, but the step house wasn't actually built here until as late as 1226 CE, so hundreds and hundreds of years later. Despite that, within 75 years, this entire area was deserted. So we've done the step house hike, the next one we're going to do is the long house hike. Now the trail here is actually open to bikes as well, and so it's about six miles long. We're not going to do the full hike though, we're just going to hike down until we can see the long house. And there is another building nearby that we'd like to see, the butcher house I think it's called. And since it's just gone one o'clock in the afternoon here in Colorado, we can already see the clouds starting to build for thunderstorms in the afternoon, so we don't want to be stuck out here for too long, which is why we're just keeping this hike nice and short. It's thought there may have been as many as eight families living in this Pueblo. All of these pueblos make up something called the Badger House community. And this pit here is known as a Great Kiva. It's one of eight Great Kivas found throughout Mesa Verde National Park. This is as close as we can get to the Longhouse today. Unfortunately, like the Cliff Palace tour this morning, to get to see the Longhouse, you also need to do a tour and we haven't booked a ticket for that one, but we can still appreciate it from up here on the Overlook. We hiked back to the parking lot and started making our way home. A stop at the main visitor centre concluded our visit to Mesa Verde National Park. In the next video, we will have some fun sandboarding at Great Sand Dunes National Park and Preserve, so hit that subscribe button and we'll see you in the next video. So what about Yanis? You have not ever seen Cliff Village before. What did you think of this? It was uh, buildings in the, in the, in the cave. Uh, it's definitely, when you haven't seen it before, it seems quite impressive and uh, um, for some reasons people decided to, to build these buildings inside the claves. There are different theories, uh, but definitely worth to see. Was it worth coming all the way from Europe to see this? <laughs> Should I answer the question? <laughs> yes, for sure. <laughs> but uh, for me, the still the most impressive uh, monument I have seen is the Black uh, Canyon. Every day I'm shuffling.